All right. Good evening, everybody. Let's give our uh, communication specialist, Jamie, a thumbs up or a yes if you are hearing me, um, if you're tuning in from Zoom. Just make sure all of our technology is fully functioning before we get going. Yes, great, okay. So hello everyone, I am Brianna Puzo. I'm the Finance and Operations Director here at Anza Borrego Foundation. And I'm so excited to welcome you to our presentation tonight. Uh, most of you are joining us from the comfort of your computer screen. So grab a drink and, and settle in. We're gonna have a great presentation tonight. We do have a few people with us here in person. So thanks for joining us here at the Steel Bernand Anza Borrego Desert Research Center. We are uh, joined by our instructor, Terry Hunnefeld for our Desert Animal Track and Sign Lecture. And um, it's gonna be truly, truly interesting to learn more about our desert wildlife, what they have going on. We at Anza Borrego Foundation love to talk about leave no trace principles for our human visitors. But when it comes to wildlife, we're actually hoping that they do leave some traces so that we get a little bit of insight into the lives of the animals that call the park home. Uh, so, and that's where our instructor, Terry Hunnefeld comes in. He is going to give us a sneak peek and help us see the hidden life of the desert. Uh, before I introduce Terry, I just want to take care of a little housekeeping. For those of you tuning in from Zoom, if you do have any questions uh, throughout Terry's presentation, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box and we will ask Terry those questions at the end. So feel free to, to type out your thoughts in Q&A. And then also for anyone who has registered for the field class, you probably know that we had to reschedule due to high winds tomorrow. So we will be um, rescheduling for Sunday morning at 8 a.m. as one class opportunity. And we've also opened up a new slot for the tracking field class with Terry this Wednesday, I believe it is the 9th. So if you're interested in, in registering and you haven't already signed up for the class, go ahead and head on over to our website where you can register for Sunday or Wednesday's class. And you'll get to see a lot of this information that you're about to learn up close and personal and a visit out into the park. So now I'm going to uh, introduce Terry Hunnefeld. He is a man who wears many hats. He is an ABF board member. He is a state park naturalist. He's also a member of the Anza Borrego tracking team and professional grandpa. Huh. He has grandchildren, but he just had a new grandson born two days ago. So uh, he's a busy guy. And so we're so happy that he joined us here tonight to tell us a little bit more about desert animal track and sign. So Terry, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks, Brianna. Okay, you know, I just remember we don't have a mouse here, do we? So I'm gonna have to, well, I can just do this. Uh, how do I get it started? Oh, I don't have to, I just do. I got it. I figured it out. Okay. All right, hello everybody. Um, okay, I'm pushing the arrow and it's not advancing. Do I have to start a slideshow? Technology. Technology. Aha, uh -huh. how's that? There we go. I think it's the okay. left and right. That's cool. And if you want the pointer. Is there a pointer? Can they? I, okay, good. Okay, you can use the arrows. Perfect. Arrows, there we go. So, um, Brianna already introduced me, so I can dispense with this slide. Um, I have, I, you're at home, and I'm here, and I have some uh, people in the audience, but I don't have very many because you're all on Zoom. And so it's uh, this this talk is really made to be able to um, talk to a group. So it's kind of interactive. So I'm going to ask you, even if you're home alone in front of your computer, still interact. You can interact on the Q and A um, with Jamie or in the chat. But uh, but it, or even just ask yourself. So when I ask a question like, what's the worst, the first word that comes to your mind when I say desert? 
think of something, maybe even say it out loud. Or if you're watching with a significant other, turn to them and say, what the first word is that come to your mind when you say desert? Um, what about the audience? What's the first word that comes to your mind? Um, dark sky. Dark sky. Okay. Ecology. Say what? Ecology. Ecology? Solitude. Solitude. Okay. Peace. Peace. Peace and quiet. Well, those are all good words that describe the desert. And that's exactly what I discovered when I first started coming over to Borrego Springs about 22 years ago as a bird watcher. And um, that's what drew me here. And then I came down the hill on Montezuma Grade and I saw the beautiful valley. And I immediately went to the visitor center and bought this book. And I now have six, six different, the six different issues of the book. It's phenomenal. And I began, that drew me into backpacking, wilderness backpacking all over the desert. And in 2012, we retired and moved here from the coast. My wife and I uh, lived on the Pacific Ocean in Encinitas, California. And uh, when we decided to move inland to get away from the marine layer and all the, uh, all the traffic, I said, we should go check all these little different desert towns in Nevada and Arizona and Southern California. And she said, well, you can go check all the towns you want, but I'm gonna live in Borrego Springs. So <laughs> here we are. And this is my house from my backyard, looking at my house, I have a beautiful view of the mountains and out the backyard, we look up the Pinion Ridge. Um, and so we have a lot, of, a lot of wildlife behind us. And you'll see some of that in tonight's presentation. Um, after we moved here, I became a visitor center volunteer, then I became a naturalist, started taking photos, but all the time I'm wondering, what are all these things out here? I'm seeing signs of life everywhere in a, in a desert that I don't normally, you don't normally go out during the day and see that much stuff, right? And I'm going, who makes all these holes? Um, who makes all these tracks? There's all these different tracks that you see. Who makes them? How do you tell the difference between uh, a feline and a canine and a mountain lion and a dog? And so I joined the Anza Borrego tracking team and we do quarterly transects around the Anza Borrego desert. Uh, same, a transect means you do the same exact route every three months and you log what kind of animals um, you find, track and sign up. Um, and I learned a tremendous amount on the tracking team. And I learned that all animals leave sign. You cannot pass through the substrate without leaving some kind of a sign. What you need to be able to do, the skills you need to be able to learn to be a good tracker, are you need to learn to recognize something. Oh, that is sign of an animal. Um, and you need to interpret it to know what animal it is and what that animal is doing. And when you develop those two little skills, it's like having magic glasses because you begin to see things that nobody else can see. So you're able to go out walking and be able to say, oh, there was a snake. Oh, look at there's frog tracks over there. Look at that, the toad tracks. Oh, look at there's a piece of toad scat. There's a coyote track. Oh, look at that, that coyote was side trotting along the, uh, along the road. It's like magic glasses. And I'm gonna to try to share some of that with you tonight. Because sometimes we think of a desert as a place where there's very little life. In reality, the desert is full of life. Most of this life is unseen. We don't see it very much, do we? We see a few animals during the day, but we don't see lots of animals, do we? Well, what are these animals doing? Why don't we see these animals? Any ideas why we don't see them? Well, they're hiding. Well, during the day, a lot of them are sleeping. So we don't see them because they're out at night, right? And every night while we're sleeping, there's a struggle for survival going on out there. Right now, as I give this talk, the nocturnal animals are out. And the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why are these animals only out here at night? What's your thought about that? Turn to the person next to you and tell them, why are they out at night and not during the day? cooler, but it's not, it's uh, 40 degrees today. Was it? <laughs> They're still out at night. Could it be something to do with their survival? Because predators are 
predators, easier to hide. It's easier to hide from predators at night. And so most of it goes on at night. It's a life or death struggle between predator and prey. That's the animals that are around us. And most of it all happens without us ever seeing it. We're in bed. It's invisible unless you know how to look for it. And that's the beauty of track and sign is that you can go out during the day and you can see exactly what happened at night, who was there and what they were doing. It's really cool. It's those magic glasses. So over the next 45 minutes or so, we're gonna cover just how abundant life is in the desert. And I'll show you some ways to identify these tracks and sign of these animals, okay? Hopefully by the time we finish up, you'll be able to go out on a walk and for the first time, put on some magic glasses. So we're gonna talk about tracks and sign. Well, this is a track, right? Now look at this track carefully and remember it because I'm gonna show it to you again in about a half an hour. And I'm gonna ask you to identify that track because you'll be able to identify it by the end of this talk. So remember that track, that's a track, but what is sign? Well, a sign is something left by the animal. It can be a track, but what other kind of sign is there? Well, a sign is something that indicates the presence of something else. So for example, what does this sign tell you? Tells you there's food, hamburgers, Diet Coke. What does this sign tell you? This is a sign. What does this sign tell you? Slippery when wet. Slippery when wet. I love it, absolutely. What does this sign tell you? The sign is a tree stump, right? But what does it tell you? Something used, to be there. Something used to be there or there's a big root system still under the ground, right? What does this sign tell you? There's a bird here. A bird built this nest. This is a bird house. So we can, these aren't tracks, but they are signs of the animal. And when we see these signs, we know what's there. For example, Here's an animal sign, okay? I put a ruler next to it. What do you, do you have an idea of what that sign is? If you're at home, turn to the person next to you and tell them what you think that is or post it in the Q&A box for Jamie. What do you think that is? It's about what, almost an inch in diameter, maybe three quarters of an inch in diameter. Any thoughts? What do you think out here in the audience? Spider, what makes you say spider? Okay, and look at this. Look at around this hole, because some people were thinking mouse, but look at around this hole, and what do you see? You see spider webbing, don't you? That is indeed a spider hole. It's a wolf spider. Now, wolf spiders come in all different sizes. They come in quarter inch size holes, half inch size holes, and three quarter inch size holes. And um, what's really cool is if you, if you take a pen out of your pocket or a little, a little twig and you tap the side of that, sometimes a spider will come right out after and attack that straw. It scares the bejeepers out of you, I'll tell you. It happened to me just last week again. A lot of fun. Okay, this is a sign. This is a sign of what? And an, it, what, what is the sign? The sign is a jawbone, right? Okay, the key is to interpret the sign, we need to know what kind of animal it is. This is an animal with a mouth full of teeth. We're looking at the jawbone here about, oh, maybe four inches long. That ruler is three inches, about four inches long. Ton of teeth. Any ideas? Who has a ton of little sharp teeth? Well, a carnivore. Meat eater. And a possum. Opossums are strict carnivores. They eat meat. They eat vertebrates and pretty much anything they can get their hands on, as you'll see with a lot of the animals that we have in the desert are predators. Here's a sign. Now, what is the sign? Scrape scratch marks in the dirt. Okay, now who might have made that? I think it was made by that guy, your dog. Those look like dog scrapes to me. And we'll, we'll look at why in a little bit. This sign is a, I'm looking at a bunch of, a bunch of um, 
debris in a tree with a hole in the side of it, sticks and twigs and silk all holding it together. That's a sign of a bird, but what bird? By looking at that nest, you can tell that it's a cactus wren, a hole in the side. Note how it's, know how its entrance hole is in the side and they're usually located in cactus. Another sign, this is like a little den. It's about six inches high and six inches wide. Who might've made that? That's a sign of a badger. Uh, one of the other signs that are real important when it comes to tracking are the scats of animals. Um, this is scat. And the question is who? I'm gonna give you a hint here is how to recognize this scat because you will see this all over the Anza Borrego Desert. We can't go out on a tracking transect anywhere and not see this sign. It, I have, somebody asks mountain lion. Um, somebody said bobcat. Okay, well, this is a bobcat. And notice how this is the, by di the digestive system of a bobcat is so advanced. It, it will eat animals whole. It'll eat a mouse or a rabbit and it'll digest it so completely that there's nothing but little, the uh, little balls. So instead of um, excreting, excreting them um, one by one, like a deer or a rabbit, it comes out in a Tootsie Roll size chunk. You'll see these all over the desert and you'll know now that you're in the presence of a bobcat latrine. This sign is of feathers. So here we have feathers. You look at these feathers. Anytime you see a barred feather like this, it's gonna be probably an owl or a hawk. I look at this, it's got, the, it's got those gray kind of a muted shade. I call this one kind of the, the prison outfit, the dull gray and dark prison outfit of a Cooper's hawk. And look at that tail on that guy, how his right here, Oh, that's all the, that gray and dark banding, Cooper's Hawk. So all those things, whether it's holes or silk or nests, it's all sign of the animals in the desert. And then the next step is to be able to interpret it. So here's a sign. What is the sign that we're looking at here? Can you see the sign? What do you see? Does it look like somebody dragged a hose? So it's a sign of a glossy snake. Yeah. Look at how thin that, look at how thin that track is and how thin the snake is, right? Now here's a similar sign, right? Look at this sign. It's also squiggling around the sand, isn't it? But does it look thicker or narrower than the one we just saw? A lot thicker, right? So is something going across the sand that's thicker than that glossy snake we just saw? Any ideas? Big fat rattlesnake. So just in this little section here, we've seen the difference between a glossy snake and a rattlesnake sign. And those are the types of things that as you learn to interpret this, it's really cool because you can go out and you can identify it. Now, this is a little tough to see. You have to look, you have to squint a little bit, but this is something buzzing through the, over the sand. And if you look up at the very top of it here, along in this area, you can see little leg kicks kicking out. So it's something with legs, but it's kind of like vibrating along on the ground. That's a tough one until you actually find the animal doing it. There's the bumblebee making that sign. And we see that um, in the summertime. Why bumblebees do that, I don't know, but we see that sign fairly frequently, particularly up in the mountains by Julian. This is one of my favorite signs. And one of the first things naturalists learn uh, to identify this sign, uh, it looks like for all the world, like five belts were laid on the sand and then picked up, doesn't it? That's a real distinctive sign. It's one of the easy ones. Once you learn it, you'll never forget it. Anybody have an idea what that sign is? It's extremely distinctive. It's a sidewinder rattlesnake. So unlike other snakes that slither along the ground and never lift themselves up, 
the sidewinder lifts its head and moves over and starts a whole new track again. And all those tracks are parallel to each other and they make that, that sign. And you can even tell by the fact that there's a hook down here at the bottom. Stop pointing with my finger and point with the pointer. Right here, you see the hook. That means the snake is going the other direction. You see it right here. Whoa, come on, Terry. You can do it. See how the hook, the hook is right over here. Oh, I'm sorry, the hook is here. Yes. So the snake is going that way. So let's talk about some of the animals in the sign that is made on animals that are the, the few animals that we see during the day in the desert. This is a squirrel, right? Looks kind of like tree squirrels if you're from the Northeast or the North, um, but it's not a tree squirrel, it's a ground squirrel. It's our California ground squirrel. And they like to dig these things right here, these holes. They love to dig holes, especially like under your garage foundation or under the sandbox or under the fence. And uh, they, can, they can be considered pests, but they were here first. And what they do is they live out um, in, in, the, in the desert. They thrive quite well in the desert. And they make a real cool track like that. You can see the claws at the very front, which um, really, really helps them for digging in the dirt. These are the ground squirrels. Then we have this guy. Any idea what this is? Yes, exactly. It's an antelope ground squirrel, or in this case, it's called it's the uh, the species or the subspecies is a white-tailed antelope ground squirrel. It'll hold its tail up over its back as kind of a reflector to reflect the hot sun. That's one of their devices that they've evolved to live in 126 degrees full sun. And they have a track very similar to the California ground squirrel, only because they are half the size, the track is half the size. If we look at some desert birds that we see during the day. And there are different types of bird tracks. I don't know if you ever noticed this before, but on the very left here, we have what we call a classic bird track the three toes pointing forward and one toe pointing back, right? That's your typical, that's what we think about when we think about a bird track. But also we have game bird tracks. These might be quail, pheasant, partridge, turkey. They're all classified as game birds. And the difference being, they don't have this toe one on the back or what's called a hallux. We're missing that. The, or the hallux is real small and abbreviated. So that's a game bird. So we have classic game bird over here. Is that interesting or what? They look like K's, don't they? One forward K and one backward K. Those are owl tracks. Over here, we all recognize this track from being at the beach, right? Gulls or ducks. So those are the four basic groups of tracks and birds. So let's look at some of them now. Here's one of the most common birds of the Anza Borrego Desert. And you can see it's got a side toe, a side toe, and a middle toe. And the next, toe, the next foot is right here. Side toe, side toe, middle toe. And right behind that, middle toe, side, side. This is the California quail. And we'll see these tracks all over. Here they're spaced a little bit further apart where you can see them clearly. Note how the middle toe is longer than the two side toes. That's a sign of California quail. They're about 1.75 inches long in that middle toe. California quail, pretty cool. In the dunes, if you've ever been over in the dunes of Anza Brego or in um, Old Springs Resort over by the landfill and airport. Um, we get running birds. We get running sparrows, sage sparrows. We also get this guy. And see, those, those are the classic bird tracks, the three toes in the front with one in the back. But notice the stride. It's running with eight to 10 inch strides. And it's the Lacant Thrasher. And they live especially in the dunes. 
and run. They're great runners and they chase invertebrates down and bugs and that's what they eat. That's what they dine on. You know, a good place to find them is out at Old Spring Preserve near the landfill. We also have diurnal birds of prey. You recognize that guy, right? The common raven. And the common raven will eat all kinds of stuff. Um, they'll feed on insects, including beetles, caterpillars, rodents, lizards, frogs, eggs, even baby bunnies, pretty much whatever they can eat, whatever they can grab, they'll eat. And they especially like garbage. They're good scavengers. Common raven, they have the classic bird track. And look at how big and beefy, they're a big bird. And look at how big and beefy that, that uh, track is. Some folks think, have, confuse them with crows, but it's pretty easy to spot a raven because you can see his bill here, how big and strong that bill is, both in flight. It's a big, strong bill. And the difference between ravens and crows is crows caw. We all know that. Ravens croak. They go, rawr, rawr. so you can hear ravens without even seeing them. But that's their track. And you find it all over the desert. Then we have these three inch long tracks. They kind of look like the tracks we talked about with owls. It's the K, but look at how narrow it is. It's a narrow K where the other K was wide. So who makes this K? Any thoughts from the audience? How about beep beep? The Roadrunner, our friend, the Roadrunner. And once you recognize this sign tonight, you'll see these signs all over your backyard and on your hikes. They look like narrow little K's as opposed to the wider blocky K of an owl. Roadrunner. And I think you'll find those in your handout, right? There's a Roadrunner track in there, I'm pretty sure. There he is. That Roadrunner was taken in my backyard with a trail cam. Just happened to get it right. And they like to eat, they're, they're herp specialists. They like lizards and snakes the best, and uh, they'll, but they'll take birds and um, they're, a, they're a strict carnivore, predator only, please. Great little dinosaur birds is what they are. Here's that different sort of K, uh, K, K shape uh, track that we saw. This is the wide owl track. Now look at this one, it's only about two inches long. I put a scale by both of those uh, photos. So you can see they're not that big. Two inches long is, is not that much bigger than a pack of matches, right? That's kind of a small bird. So we know it can't be a great horned owl. What kind of owl? And plus this owl's out during the day. This is a diurnal bird, not a nocturnal bird. So what owl do we have out here that's out during the day, hunting during the day? the burrowing owl. They have nice little two inch tracks and they'll eat a variety of prey, um, including insects, dragonflies, grasshoppers, but they hunt by sight, not by sound like the great horned and barn owls do at night. Burrowing owl, nice little two inch. So you find little two inch owl tracks. This is the culprit. They also like to eat snakes and vertebrates. We have one other diurnal prey animal to talk about today. What is the largest prey animal? Now, a prey animal is a vegetarian. And carnivores eat prey animals. So prey animals don't eat, well, I guess they can eat, um, they can eat. Some prey animals are also carnivores. This is a of an omnivore. I'm sorry, a vegetarian. Any idea? Uh, big horn? The bighorn sheep. And who eats bighorn sheep? Mountain lions. And folks say, well, we have a lot of bighorn sheep here at Borrego. We see them all the time, but we don't see any mountain lions. It's because the mountain lions are nocturnal, right? They're nocturnal. And they have to get about a bighorn or a deer every four or five days. 
here's Bighorn Tracks. And many of you have, maybe have seen them around, um, seen the animals in um, Borrego Palm Canyon. But it's really great if you start paying attention and you can see the tracks. And as you, uh, as you do this more, you get to learn, you get to, you get the feel of how old the tracks are. You can tell if they were just there the evening before or a couple days ago. And here's some big horn scat. They kind of look like little chocolate peanuts, don't they? So you'll find a lot of this in Brago Palm Canyon or even around um, the pupfish pond at the, at the opening to at the mouth to the canyon. Then what beetle, this is like the last of the diurnal things that we'll see during the day. What beetle do we frequently see during the day in Borrego? No, not that kind of beetle. No, no. <laughs> this beetle. Are stink bugs, right? You guys seen stink bugs? The bugs, if you tease them a little bit, they put their butt up in the air. And what's neat about these guys is about, in most beetles, they'll leave check marks as they as they walk. If you look at this, you see these check marks along here? And here the check marks are expanded for you so that it can be easy. So see this check mark here? So we know that the beetle was walking in this direction, it was walking to the right the Eloides beetle. This was kind of tough to see, but it's a good one because we're looking at here, um, we're not looking at the tracks of a beetle, we're looking at a track that goes from here all the way over to here. It's about two inches, two and a half inches wide is the trail width of this set of tracks. I've got four legs here, one, two, three, four, and I can see three over on this side of the animal, one, two, three. This is an invertebrate. This is not a mammal. Um, got pretty big feet though, doesn't it? And it's got, it's pretty wide. It's three inches wide. Any ideas from our audience? I'm sorry? Tarantula? Tarantula is right, right there. And this tarantula, was going, I took the photo of him as he was going up a sand dune and he was actually um, kind of slipping back, which is why, why he made those oblong, those oblong marks in the sand. So he was slipping downhill as he went up. So they're pretty distinctive. Again, if you come across sets of three or four tracks on either side, they're going to be a tarantula. That thick. So now we go to the really interesting part, the nocturnal part that many of these animals that you'll never see during the day or you seldom see during the day um, that are out at night, we'll take a look at their sign. And we have to start at the bottom of the food chain. The bottom of the food chain are the prey. This is why all the carnivores get their meals. And these are very important animals to carnivores. Um, Cute little pocket mice. We think the mice that we have out here in the desert, uh, the mice and the rats, um, are not the vermin that came over from Asia and Europe uh, 400 years ago. These are guys that are more like hamsters or gerbils. They're, um, they're pretty tame. Um, I mean, they're not tame. They don't let you handle them without getting trapped, but um, they're not... Um, they're friendly little guys. And what they do is they eat seeds and they're very important to the ecology of the desert because they distribute seeds and aerate the soil. And there's literally thousands of them. These are pocket mice and they're called pocket mice because they have pouches, fur lined pouches on the outside of their cheeks. And these pockets, they fill them up with seeds and they come out. Of their, of their burrows, maybe only for 15 minutes a night. And they come out and they grab as many seeds as they can. They're finding, they're, they're on a mission to find seed. And they come out and they, they look at how this guy, how his cheeks are just all full. And he's full, of, he's filled his pouch up full of seeds. Why? Why, are, why don't they just go out and leisurely eat seeds at night? Why are they so so 
so, so bent to get in and out of their burrow or out and in. Why wouldn't they just walk around and keep eating seeds? Because they're out in the open and they're predators. These guys are like popcorn to coyotes and bobcats. These are great little snacks and bobcats and coyotes are out all the time at night and they're looking for these guys. They're looking for pocket mice. They're looking for the, the small rodents to eat. Um, they're important food. So they serve a valuable function in their role of distributing seed and aerating soil, but they're also valuable food for our predators. And here's their tracks. They're really distinctive tracks, these little pocket mice. Um, this track right here is the two front tracks. Their two front paws here, and then they bound with these are their hind feet. So kind of like a rabbit hops, you got up, uh, but, but instead of having the two feet in front of each other, they have the feet right next to each other, and then they bound with their hind feet around. And they, this is called bounding. So they'll go from here over to here. Pocket mouse. And the sign of a pocket mouse, if you don't see their tracks, um, you'll see their holes. You cannot walk by a creosote bush or a burrow bush um, or out here in the desert without seeing a bunch of holes, right? And I've always, when I first moved out here, thought, who makes all these holes? Well, pocket mice are highly social. So we have a couple of reasons for all the holes. One is, um, what if a predator comes in the front door? You wanna get out a back door, right? So this is what they have to do, is they have front doors, back doors, but they also have connections to their neighbor's units. So it's like, um, it's like pocket mouse condos. But some of the authors uh, liken it to, uh, the authors for tracking, they liken it to uh, this, what they call a Swiss cheese effect. So when you're out, you see underneath the creosote bush, all these holes are about one inch in diameter. And I, there's, there's some uh, illustrations of the size of holes in the handout that, I, uh, that we posted online for you. Um, Swiss cheese, you're looking at the condos of pocket mice. Now we have the bigger cousin of pocket mice, they're called kangaroo rats. And kangaroo rats get their names from their long kangaroo-like tail and their long kangaroo-like um, feet. And we have two species here in the desert. We have the Merriam's kangaroo rat, they're cute little seed eaters. Um, and I think I have a video here. I don't know if I get to play or not. Well, maybe I can't. Well, trust me, he's out scavenging seeds. Oh, there he goes. Look at him. So he's gathering seeds as fast as he can, put them in his pouches so he can get back in his burrow and not get eaten, right? That was in my backyard. So look at that cheeks. Those, oh, I keep pointing. I have to use my pointer. Look at those cheeks, he's full. Now the Merriam's kangaroo rat is not very social. So you'll find only one of their burrows, maybe every 20, 30, 40 feet. And they're smaller. They're about two ounces max. And then we have, oh, remember I said they're not very social? Look at this. Here's a couple of guys that are competitors for the seeds and they don't like each other very much. Whoa. I know I got that last one to play. How did I do that? Mm -hmm. well, I have to trust me, they're fighting. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder why one played and one didn't. Maybe I try that one. No, nope, that one. No, nope, that one. Oh, well, technology. So anyway. They have those long kangaroo-like feet, right? So their feet kind of look like little paddles of the Merriam's kangaroo rat. Um, here's one bounding along on its toes. So you have a foot here and a foot here. And there's actually a little tail drag. He let his tail down a little bit, two tracks. So he's kind of hopping along as he goes. And right here in the middle, you can see where he put his front feet down for a minute. 
That's a kangaroo rat, the Merriam's, a smaller one. And here, as they slow down a little bit, you can see their tail drag right here. So he has his tail off to the side, dragging it along. Now the desert kangaroo rat lives out mostly in the dune area. You'll find them a lot around the landfill. Old Springs are in the dunes near the Badlands of Anza Borrego. They're twice as much, they weigh twice as much. They're almost four ounces and they're highly social. They live in communities and look at how big their feet are. They have big feet inch and a half long and look how wide they are. They're almost three quarters of an inch wide and they'll hop along the sand. And here you see a whole bunch of them here. You see their big tracks and their tail drags all over. And you'll find them a lot, especially around Thonts Point when I lead hikes out there, we find their sign and their trails all over the place. There's one of their little burrows. You can see it's about three and a half inches high and four or five inches wide. Looks like a little, a, a little miniature um, badger burrow, doesn't it? Quite big for uh, the size of the animal. That's kind of standard for them. And here's a little seed dig. You'll find these all over the desert. Little digs where the animal has placed a foot here and a foot here. You see their footprints there and their tail dragged here. And with their front paws, they were digging for seeds, either to get seeds or to bury seeds. That's what kangaroo rats. Sign, good sign for kangaroo rat. Then rabbits and hares, we have black-tailed jackrabbit, we have cottontail out here. And cottontail are the little guys, they're only about two pounds. And this is their track pattern. You have the two hind tracks and the two fronts. So you remember in the pocket mouse where they're their, their two fronts were side by side. The rabbit is a right front foot, a left front foot, and then a left hind and a right hind. And this is a typical pattern of a desert cottontail bounding along. Here's, a, here's the same thing again, a left front, right front, right hind, left hind. Which way is it going? It's going to the left. So it's going from right to left. So it's kind of hard to illustrate um, on a Zoom call, but they're, uh, they're putting their two front feet down and then their, their hind feet comes around their body and lands in front of their body and propels them. So both, both cottontail and um, black-tailed jackrabbits get all their propulsion from their hind legs. And here's some feeding sign of cottontail. What do they eat when there's no vegetation in the desert? Well, they'll eat the bark of plants, but they'll go beyond the bark. Right underneath the bark of all living plants is what's called a cambium, cambium layer. And the cambium layer is the actual nutrition for that feeds the plant. And that's where all the vitamins and minerals are in the nutrition for the plant and the, and the, um, the cottontails and the jackrabbits will eat that and they'll even, even eat through that to where you get a squared off appearance on these branches here. You can see right here where it's kind of a, a looks squared off and up here, and they're actually eating the bark as well. And that's how they get their nutrients when there's no green stuff around to eat. Here you can see some more, this is typical um, cottontail sign. So when you see this sign, you know that there's cottontails around. You'll also find their scat right underneath the plant. And that looks kind of like this. Cottontail scat kind of look, they're, they're pea size like that. And it's all full of vegetation, digested vegetation. And here's another uh, cottontail sign, one that you might have seen and not, not known what it was. This is the urine sign. And um, there's a pellet right there, one of their scats. And this is a typical urine sign. Cottontails always live around water, so they urinate frequently. And here's the here's the urination, and there's the there's the scat there. And this is what it looks like when it dries. So if you've ever walked across the desert and you've seen white marks like this, I always used to think they were birds. But what bothered me 
is some of this, the white uric acid was splatted as if it did come from a raven and probably did a raven or a hawk, um, but other was, did not splat. It's like this. And I never knew what that was until I joined the tracking team and learned that that's cottontail sign. That's the dried uric acid. There's uh, more cottontail sign there, a lot of it under a bush. And to contrast against the two pound desert cottontail, we have the big jackrabbit, three to five pounds. These guys are big. There was one um, on Yaki Pass a few weeks ago that got hit by a car and I took it off the road. It was in the middle of the road. So I picked it up and took it off to the side so the coyotes could get it. And um, it was heavy. And there's a, gives you a good illustration of the difference in the size between those jackrabbits and the cottontail. Cottontail scat on the left and jack on the right. Quite a difference, big animal. And look at the bottom of their feet. Sometimes you wonder when you're tracking why you know a rabbit had come across uh, a fairly smooth stretch of sand and you cannot find a track. You look at all that fur, they have nothing but fur on the bottom of their tracks. And it's only in mud that you'll get a track like this. These are black-tailed jackrabbit hind tracks. They kind of vaguely resemble a dog and sometimes trackers confuse these for dogs. That's, uh, these are jackrabbit tracks in mud where the, because of the mud and the, the wet fur on the feet, their toes are actually able to register in the ground. So that's a lot of the prey that the predators that are out at night eat but what about the predators themselves? Uh, what are some predators? Well, here's that. This one has that big K and it's got four inch track diameter. Now we know what the K is, right? The big K is an owl. What's our biggest owl out here? It's the great horned owl. It's big, it's robust, and it's strong. And it's a great horned owl. And these guys are rodent specialists at night. When these, when these kangaroo rats out are out and pocket mice are out at night, these guys do it all by sound. And that's sometimes the last thing one of these mice sees or feels are those talons closing around them. Look at how rectangular those feet are of a great horned owl. You can see where that K shape comes from, can't you? Isn't that cool? That is one set of talons there. And we know what they eat. They eat pocket mice and kangaroo rats and they don't have teeth. So they can't, they can't, they, they can't, they have to swallow the animal whole. When they swallow the animal whole, owls have a digestive system to where like, um, where they will, the, the animal will not go all the way into the stomach. It'll stop in the crop and it will be dissolved by strong stomach acids. And all that'll be left is bones, which will be coughed up as an owl pellet. And we've, many of us have dissected owl pellets in high school or junior high. And we'll find these here in the desert quite a, quite a bit. Here's one that I dissected. This is a desert kangaroo rat on the right and on the left, is a desert kangaroo rat skull. I found that skull intact, just like that. And there's the mandible, the lower jaw, desert kangaroo rat in one owl pellet. Isn't that amazing? An owl could have swallowed that whole animal whole. Incredible. It gives you a, a sense of how big and strong these great horned owls are. We also have a lot of barn owls out here in the desert. Their, their sign, their track looks very similar. It's about a three inch track instead of a four inch track. What about mammal predators though, that are out at night? Anybody recognize that track? It looks kind of like, I think I have another one here. Yeah, like a human hand, doesn't it? What do you think? Human hand, who has little hands? What animal out here has human hands? Look at those hands, are they cool or what? You only found raccoons around trees and water. So there's only two places, there are probably more, the two places that I've seen since I've become a tracker out here in the desert, I've seen them in Coyote Canyon 
and I see them in Grapevine Canyon up by Angelina Springs. I find their tracks. And otherwise, you're up in the mountains to find them. I don't think I've ever seen them out in any of the other washes because we just don't have that much running water here and they need water. Water and trees are what attract raccoons, but look at that hand-like print there. Now here's the tracks of our most common predator. That guy. We know who that is, right? Because they're all over here, right? They're everywhere. I don't know if this will play. Let's see if it'll play. If I double click it. Oh, that's the coyote. And the coyote tracks look a lot like dog tracks. I want you to pay attention closely to one thing though. Look at these tracks here. Look at up front. Notice those two little pinpricks in front of those middle toes. That differentiates a coyote from a domestic dog. Here, we don't see any, we don't see any nails here. No claws on these tracks. But look at how oblong these tracks are. They're ovals. They're not round. A dog is much rounder. And this is kind of the typical presentation of a coyote. Um, we'll see a lot of tracks in the desert that we can't identify because they're so partial or because the substrate is so loose or the wind has worked on it a little bit. But here we can see these are coyote. We can see the triangular heel pad here. You can see his side toes here middle toes here, and there's the claws registering out front. But because the substrate is so soft, they kind of they kind of exploded a little bit instead of being pinpricks. That's not an atypical presentation. That's what we see. That's how we identify coyote. And the coyote scrapes are different than dogs too. They're not as violent as a dog and they're not as playful. They have more of a purpose. They're scent marking. Coyotes have scent marks and the bottom of their palms, their palm pads. And they do that to mark their territory. Territory. So if they find some food, they'll do some scraping around there to let others know that they've been there. This is my territory, stay out. They're also omnivores. They're predators. They'll eat, they'll eat meat, they'll eat rodents and squirrels and snakes. Um, they're um, they're real adaptable, um, but you can tell what they've been eating by their scat. You can actually see the sign in their scat. For example, palm seeds. They love palm seeds. Here's big palm seeds. Um, here's date palms. Now, date palms are normally in residential areas. Um, they like dates a lot, and they'll swallow the whole date um, entirely. And what they'll, they'll digest the date itself and the scat will contain the seeds. We find those. Here's cat claw seeds. We all know what cat claw is, the wait a minute bush. Um, those big long beans of seeds that hang off of those are a member of the pea family. They'll eat those whole. And we can see the little seeds right in here in the scat. Um, here's a small mammal diet. Look at this fur. It's all completely twisted pinched, um, folded back on itself. That's typical coyote um, scat of, of, eating, uh, of eating mammals, furry animals. Now, this looks like a canine scat, right? But does not like the coyote. The coyote remembers twisted, ropey, pinched, and tapered. This is different. It's kind of uniform. And any idea who that is? Anybody own a dog? Yeah, you know, that's the guy. <laughs> kibble, that's kibble scat. So you've seen that before, you've smelled it before. It's different than coyote scat by a long shot. So let's talk about dog versus coyote tracks. Again, over on the left, look at these pinpricks out in front of the toes. There's a side toe claw as well, and the side toe over here, there's the pinprick. Look at how oblong or, 
or oval this track is and how these side toes are, are, are just tucked right in. It's a very streamlined athletic track. Over here, notice how much wider the dog track is, how these toes on the sides are not tucked in, how these claws are big and blunt, how the pad is sloppy. It's not a nice tight little triangle like the coyote, but it's kind of a blob. And that's because um, house dogs or human uh, dogs that live with humans, they don't get the exercise and they're not as trim and as fit as coyotes are. Coyotes are out for one thing, a survival. They don't, they don't, have, they don't have time or the energy to goof off. They're constantly on the lookout for food and survival where dogs will get um, a little, little sloppy. So here's another illustration of it. A coyote, again, look at those pinpricks versus the dog. Look at the oval versus the dog as a rounder shape. In fact, a lot of times we can spot a dog a mile away just by looking at the roundness of the, of the track. Also, the, the, the palm pad is usually much larger in a dog. The negative space, this area where there is no toe compressing the ground in the middle, a coyote is small, or it can be much larger in a dog. So those are some of the basic ways to tell a dog from a coyote. It's a fine art, because there are some dogs that can, that, that can look like coyote, especially some feral dogs, uh, dogs that have escaped or have run away, or for whatever reason, they're not, they're not human, domesticated dogs. Their tracks can resemble a coyote depending on the breed. So we saw this track at the beginning of the presentation, right? Remember this one? So you should be able to tell what that track is now, right? What is that, a dog or a coyote? Bingo, dog, you got it. Let's talk about feline predators ambush predators. If any of you have or have ever had a cat, you've watched it, right? They take their time, they're stealth predators, and they'll often sit and wait. I've seen Bobcat in the early morning at dawn, just sitting by a rabbit track, waiting for a rabbit to come by, not moving, just like my cat at home used to do. This is one I have a, in my backyard. I have four big water pans with faucets next to them that I fill up with water every day for the birds. And I attract um, bobcat and coyote regularly to those pans of water. And here we will touch on the difference in a feline track. A bobcat track is about the same size as a, as a coyote track. And notice how the feline doesn't show claws at all. They seldom do. And when they do, they're extremely sharp. You immediately recognize that's not anything but a real sharp needle-like feline print. Also, they have a big palm pad. This is a big palm pad versus the, the triangle of a coyote, probably illustrated better here. Now again, the the dog track or the coyote track is oval. It's a rectangle where the feline is more of square, it's more of a round track. You can draw an X through the negative space in a coyote track. You cannot draw an X because that palm pad, look how big this palm pad is. It's a trapezoid on the feline. Here's the claws again. Felines don't normally show claws, except if they're unstable. If their paws are going into mud or into deep snow, they'll unsheath them. They'll poop, they'll pop out. Um, but that's, that's about the only time you'll ever see claws in a feline. The other thing in a feline, it doesn't really illustrate it well here in this photo, but you can see that this, this toe three here, is a leading toe. Um, dog tracks and coyote tracks are perfectly symmetrical. These two lead toes and two side toes are perfectly lined up. We call that a symmetrical track, where a bobcat 
uh, will be a leading toe as, as, as your house cat and your mountain lions will have. And I think I have an illustration that will show that better. Bobcats and this big trapezoidal pad, they have two lobes up here where a canine only has one, and they have three lobes down here. So there's a bobcat track. See the ruler here? It's about one and three quarter inches long. There's the three lobes on the bottom, the two lobes on the top. And look at this leading toe. Nice teardrop shaped leading toe. That's a quintessential bobcat track. Beautiful. Here's another one from a different angle. There's my three, my three lobes on a big trapezoidal pad. There's my leading toe. Here's a leading toe again. So see how asymmetrical that track is compared to a dog or a coyote. Here's a couple more again. Leading toe right here, leading toe right here. Big, big palm pad. So we can take a look over here and we can see that the palm pad is very big and um, on these, uh, the track is um, oval or round. So can you name another canine predator? Fox, bushy, black-tipped tail. We actually have two foxes in the desert. We have kit fox, which I'm not covering tonight. This is the one you're more likely to see around town. I see them in my backyard. Are they predator or are they prey? They're both. They'll be eaten by coyotes and mountain lions, and maybe even bobcats, because they're pretty small little dogs. This is one, I wonder how I got that first one to play and not this one. Anyway, um, this is in my backyard. This is the, uh, my, my backyard, the fence. And here he is coming across and he's real twitchy because A, he's by our house and B, there's coyotes around uh, during, at, at the water drips. So he's real twitchy where over here I have him down in the narrows by a drift and he's in the riprap there and there's no predators around because he's in the protection of the riprap and he's completely at ease. So because they're always in fear of being eaten, they're very twitchy compared to other predators. And they have the most beautiful round little tracks. It's a canine track for sure. It's symmetrical. Look at those two side toes are lined right up. Perfect little triangles. Beautiful symmetrical round track, only an inch and a half in diameter. Beautiful tracks, gray fox. Often you'll find a lot of fur in their tracks that was made in mud. So that was a canine predator. There's one feline nocturnal predator we haven't covered tonight. Any guesses? What? Yeah, that one. Good guess. There it is. There's a picture of one that one of my trail cams got up by Scissors Crossing. Here's the tracking team in Grapevine Canyon at Angelina Springs. We had just finished a transect and we came, we were up right up against um, the vegetation that's impenetrable here going to the spring itself. And there are rock ledges around here. And we found where a mountain lion had been waiting on one of the rock ledges. And when the mule deer had come up to graze on the green grass from dripping down from the, from the, the <clears throat> water coming down from the spring, the mountain lion pounced on it. And they bite right in the back of their neck and sever their spine. And we found the predated mule deer right here. Here's tracks 
that we found of mountain lions a couple of years ago, 2020. There's this big palm pad and it's four toes going around. Here's one we found in 2021. Here's the big palm pad with a trilobing down here. And here's the lead toe right here. You can see now how it gets more subtle, a little bit um, more opaque as far as being able to interpret these tracks. You have to look at the palm pad. You have to see the two lobes up here, the three lobes down here, the leading toe. So this is a mountain lion track in coarse sand in Grapevine Canyon in 2021. Here's one in Coyote Canyon that we had um, a, a, just this last December. This was a beautiful one because it was made in dust by the side of the road. And look at that leading toe, Isn't that beautiful? And the big palm pad with the two lobes at the top and the three big lobes at the bottom. That is right in Coyote Canyon where the gate is that, um, where you can't go past the gate anymore in the summertime for the sheep, where they lock it off. That's where we found this mountain lion track. And then we found one there again, perhaps the same lion a month later in January, 2022, leading toe, big palm pad, trilobing. And then lastly, we found one this February, just last week on Coyote Canyon. There's the leading toe, big round track, trilobing at the bottom. This one has, was made in mud and it's been rained on, it's still there. So we covered a ton, didn't we? A lot of animals. We learned how to recognize track and sign. We learned how to interpret track and sign. We learned about the morphology of tracks, scat, holes, abundance of life in the desert. But before we get to questions and answers, I'd like you in 10 words to think to yourself or say to the person next to you, what's your takeaway from this? What's your aha? What you got today from this, from this talk? Something you didn't know before. All right. I figure you all did that, right? So here's the pop quiz. You all love pop quizzes. Okay, look at this. I've got two little feet, a tail drag, two little feet, a tail drag, two little feet, tail drag. Can you remember who that is? Kangaroo rat. Boing, 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 just like a kangaroo. There he is. Okay, how about this one? Look at these. We have oval symmetrical tracks about two and a half inches long. Who do we think that is? Coyotes. Here we have a running bird in a sand dune with classic tracks. A thrasher, right? You all knew that. Here we have a, a den. This thing is like eight inches wide and eight, nine inches high. Who dug that? The badger. You knew that too. Oh, look at this. Tootsie Rolls, right? Bobcat. Bingo. Okay. This is when we looked at two different tracks of during our talk. Two hind tracks. Two front tracks going to the right. Who? Rabbit. Rabbit. You got it. And look at those paddles. You can just see it. there's the handle of the paddle and there's the paddle at like a tennis racket, right? Who? Big, two big feet hopping along. That's the big boy, the desert kangaroo rat. So, Every single one of these animals have a function here in Anza Borrego Desert. They all are either predators or prey. They all serve valuable ecological niches. And the mission of Anza Borrego Foundation is to protect and preserve this wildlife habitat for the benefit and enjoyment of present, but most importantly to me, future generations. 
I give a lot of my time and money to Enz Abrego Foundation because I want this desert to be preserved. And Enz Abrego has an extensive educational program and an extensive land acquisition program so that we can continue to build the park, protect these animals, as well as archeological and geological and paleontological treasures that we have. It's so important. I urge you um, to please donate or join Anza Brego Foundation if you haven't already. It's a wonderful organization. And help us preserve the desert. I like to think my grandson who was just born two days ago, I like to think that he'll bring his grandson out here and it'll be much the same as I enjoy because I feel like I stand on the shoulders of giants for people who built this desert, who put it together and made it possible. 600,000 acres, a thousand square miles of wilderness that I can go out in every day for free. Just imagine, imagine this a hundred years from now, if we can preserve it. That's the mission of Anza Borrego Foundation. The tracking field trip. So those of you who are going with me on Sunday and Wednesday morning, we'll be meeting at Christmas Circle on the south side of Christmas Circle, kind of opposite of where they have the farmer's market. But we'll be right on the circle and we're gonna depart at 8 a.m. sharp. So you'll wanna arrive around 7.50, 7.55. We've got some forms you have to sign. You know, the liability waivers, you don't have COVID and stuff. Um, Two-wheel drive is okay, but if you have a four-wheel drive, that's preferred. Um, we'll make do with what we have. So if you have a four-wheel drive, drive it is what I'm saying. If not, then don't worry about it. We'll figure it out. Dress in layers. Um, it could be 40 degrees at early in the morning at eight o'clock but it can go to 60, from 40 to 60 in an hour. And you wanna be able to layer it up. I always take a hat, water, snack, hiking shoes and a hiking pole. You don't need a hiking pole. We're not gonna do a lot of hiking. We're gonna be moving really slowly, but a hiking pole, you can mark things in the sand. So if you see a track or a sign, you can circle it or make a mark by it so you don't lose it before we come over and take a look at it to help you ID what it is. Um, please, hiking shoes, no open-soled shoes. There will be cactus around a lot. Uh, and that's kind of all. We're to the questions part. Mm. Um, have you ever seen or heard reports of jaguars in Anzabrega Park coming north from Mexico? No. Okay. Can you repeat the question? Oh, have we ever heard of uh, jaguars coming north from Mexico? The answer is no. I know of no instance where a jaguar has ever been in um, California. Um, Patricia says, excellent lecture. Is Terry a teacher by profession? I used to be, uh, I used to be in adult training, yes. Okay. Wonderful. Is there any questions from the audience tonight? Well, then there you have it. I'll let you guys go. And um, I hope to see a lot of you Sunday. Uh, we have, um, I think there's still three or four openings for Sunday morning, um, if you wanna come with us. And there's more openings for Wednesday as well. So give ABF a call or you can do it online too, right? Yeah, the, website. On, the website, there's the website right there. I put it in the chat. And you put it in the chat. Okay, there you go. Patricia so, wants to know if you see ringtail tracks. Ringtail? Yes. Well, I'll tell you, we weren't sure where ringtail was in Anza Borrego Desert till one day at the Narrows, um, we were doing a transect that we do. In the Narrows, we have two mountains coming together there by uh, the Narrows Earth Trail. And bighorn sheep cross there regularly, which is why we do a transect to monitor how many sheep come through. There's all this riprap where when they blasted out Highway 78 going through the wash, um, there's uh, this big, huge chunks. And we were over there one day looking for wood rat nests. And we came across this latrine. And it looked like bobcat scat, but it was too small and it wasn't segmented like a Tootsie Roll. And we didn't know what it was. So we put a trail camera there, it was ringtail. 
since then, we have more trail cameras out there and we have several ringtail out there as well as spotted skunk, striped skunk, kit fox, gray fox, all in the narrows. Um, our next quest is to find ringtail tracks. The substrate at the narrows, we know there are ringtail there, but that granite little granules, you know, they're tiny, they're, they're big chunks of sand is what they are. And they don't register tracks. They register tracks of a bighorn sheep really well, but not ringtails. But our goal is to find a ringtail track. All right, with that, we're finished. Thanks for joining us. All right, well, thank you so much, Terry. We did cover a lot. I learned a lot, and I hope you learned a lot from the presentation this evening. I just will do a quick plug for our next lecture and field class coming up April 1st. We will be um, studying native bat species of the park and an opportunity to go out on a night walk with a bat researcher, Don Endicott. So we get to learn all about BATS 101 as well as hear the results of his acoustic survey that's been going on for almost two years in Borrego Palm Canyon. So I hope you'll join us for that again on April 1st. And for those of you going out with Terry, you're gonna learn a lot. You're gonna get to see all of this out in the park and, and I hope you enjoy it. So thanks again for joining us everyone and we will sign off. I hope you have a wonderful evening and weekend. Hope to see you in the desert soon.